I am Tufa Jallo, and I was raped by the president of my country when I was 19 years old. Mind you, I do not say allegedly. I leave that to you. Before that happened, I had no idea that such a thing was even possible. Because in my country, no one speaks about these things. We have no name for it. With no words to describe it, how could such a thing even happen? Let alone by a president, who for many of us young people was almost a godly figure. When I was born, he was already in power, and his image stared at you everywhere you turned. Jame was all we knew. I had to flee the country and leave everything behind. It's only when I found myself in a space of survival that I came to realize that men in power do get a kick out of course in submission, of establishing their domination on women's bodies. For Jame, it wasn't enough to be powerful, ordering torture and killings, no. He needed to leave his indelible trace of supremacy on us. He led by example, and many of his subordinates did exactly the same. And across oceans, other men who didn't rule nations, but lived in a bubble of power foiled by the silence and quasi-worship of people around them. They too did exactly the same. Think of Harvey Weinstein. He used his power, both physical in terms of his huge size and power in terms of his standing within the industry to violently assault, rape uh, and abuse women. Of Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein was a billionaire New York businessman whose vast wealth bought an arrogance that knew no limits. Damn the consequences, he acted as if he could have anything he craved. But what he desired most was sex with young women and girls. For years, he abused them at will. And El Chapo. Drug-lord Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera, known as El Chapo, considered the youngest of the girls as his vitamins because raping them gave him life. But as history has shown, even the most powerful men fall. After 22 years of a brutal regime, Jame had to flee the country in January of 2017. Gambian celebrated his departure and soon after a truth commission was set up. We call it the TRC. And it did announce that it will hold an entire session on sexual violence. But even before that, sexual violence did come up at the TRC several times. But often as a side detail, and many did not even pay attention to it. References to exploitation and violence against women, as so often, remained unacknowledged. In July of 2019, Several members of the Junglers, which was Jamis' personal dead squad, testified at the TRRC, and the country stood still. Two of these killers mentioned sexual violence when speaking about something different, but no one seemed to take notice. Here, one of the most notorious killers, Malik Jata, was interrogated about what the Junglers would do when they were done killing and how life at their headquarters was like. There was a lot of alcohol, correct? Yes, correct. Were you drinking? I was not drinking. There was a lot of cannabis. Yes. Were you smoking? I was smoking heavily then. All of you were smoking heavily? Yes, sir. And what other vice was going on in there? That was this uh, lady's they bring in, and I wouldn't be happy with that, but I wouldn't choose to obstruct them too. Where would they get them from? Place. They used to come from places like Kawas, and they would sometimes go, come up to Senegambia to pick whatever is their choice. And how about the trafficking in cannabis? It was going on. Wait. Back to the ladies. 
Were these women sex workers? If yes, were they paid or were they forced? Why would Mali Jata not like the fact that they were brought in? But the trafficking in and smoking of cannabis seemed more important to dwell on. Which they were made for me that I'm against them. Here is another jungler, Ismail Njame, who, unlike Malik Jata, did not commit to any implications in the crimes committed and had very heated arguments with the lead counsel. In one instance, he denied participating in the killing of several men in April of 2006 and claimed that he was just a bystander. And in the effort to justify that position, he used this expression. That is what you want us to believe. You know, there's a saying, they said, if you know that you cannot avoid the rape, just enjoy the sex. And indeed, you this did. One, you, what I'm saying is, and you did. <laughs> well, I can assure you, there is no such saying in our local languages. This was probably made up by the jungler or similar circles. But we will never know, because no follow-up question was asked, despite the fact that the TRC had had witnesses Speaking of rape and gang rapes committed by men in uniform. If this was indeed a saying, how did it translate in military camps, killing sprees, and prison cells? Speaking of prisons, a witness mentioned that female prisoners were brought to David Coley, the director of the infamous Mile 2 prison. A prison described by the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture as cruel inhumane and degrading. I mean, so, boy boy David Kole, he was a stooge of David Kole. David Kole, whatever David Kole needed, he did it for him. If he is not present, Fadjou will do it for him. Because for them, Jimbo of Kole, he did it Jimbo used to bring women for him. And when Jimbo is not there, Pajou used to bring women for him. Oh. Yes. And at that one, many officers in the prison system knew about it. When you say boy boy, what exactly do you mean? So here I want boy boy. No, 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 take it. Was this oddly? Again. Not a single question was asked about what was just said, which to me sounds like the director David Coley was raping female prisoners. He and his boy boy Lamin Sao both came to testify. Yet never were they asked a single question on sexual violence. And this was supposed to be an entire session devoted to the conditions in prison. As a matter of fact, the TRC only discussed the male wings but failed to examine the conditions in the woman's wing. When men talk, women's stories remain invisible. And when a very few find the courage to testify, their stories are doubted. One of them was Binta Mane. She preferred not to show her face, but her name and story are well known in the Gambia. She was raped by a man in uniform in the year 2000 when she was just 15 years old. She told the TRC what had happened to her. You told us that at that point he assaulted you. Is that correct? Uh, yes. What do you mean by that? Because I am He fell me on the ground and he imposed himself on me forcefully. Did you sustain any injuries in your private part? Yes, because when he released me, uh, blood was uh, flowing. I was, I was going, returning, crying along the way.
but little was known about the fate of the girl and how she suffered not only from the rape but also from the stigma. She was forced out of school and married off by her father to an older man who according to her own words she did not appreciate. Which means that she had to have sex she did not consent to. A legalized rape to save the honor of the family. Let that sink in for a moment. Her testimony was extremely powerful and backed by other witnesses. Her teacher, a student activist, a brother, all confirming what had happened to her. But when the TRC referenced her story, they continued to use the word alleged. Listen to that exchange the lead council had with the former vice president of the Gambia, Aisa Tunjai Saidi about this case. As vice president of the country, mm -hmm. didn't you know that there was a problem in Birkama? I didn't. I was told during the demonstration. After the demonstration, the security briefed me, yes. Then I Did knew. you at any stage hear mm -hmm. that a student called Ibrahim Abari was killed or died in Birkama? I only knew when the demonstration happened and they explained that to me, yes. The security told me. Did you hear before that day that a girl from Birkamaba Secondary School was allegedly raped at the independent That stadium? also the, the security told me when Ma the demonstration Ma happened. Ma Madam Vice President, did you read the newspapers about what was happening in your country? Did you hear that? Allegedly. Allegedly is the word that sticks to rape. At the TRC in the Gambia and often around the world, the stories of men who were tortured are believed. But we, the female survivors, often our stories are still only alleged until the courts decide, if ever. In October of 2019, the TRC published a list of upcoming teams and only for sexual violence was the term alleged use. Not for the witch hunt, not for the torture, not for the killings, not for the arrest. And not only are sexual crimes alleged, but for the special session on sexual violence, the TRC changed its methods. While before it had been eager to hear names of accused perpetrators, when it came to sexual violence, witnesses were told expressly not to mention the names of perpetrators. Instead, they had to use numbers. Can you look at your list and tell us um, who are some of the individuals that you would call in order to bring um, um, people to the residence late at night? Killing. One. Fla. Two. Survival was very difficult and seeing seeing a man who could help but he only wanted you to go to a hotel room with him in order for him to help. His name is on on the sheet is uh, number forty four. Who and what exactly does that protect? This young woman preferred to remain anonymous. She told the commission about the many instances in her life she was harassed and attacked by men in power. A religious leader, state officials, even one who's still working for the Ministry of Justice. But the reason she was asked to testify was that she had worked as a protocol officer for Jame for three years. During her testimony, she described a system of rape and sexual exploitation of young vulnerable women. Yeah, Jamie was very powerful and corny and using his position of authority, he put a system in place using state institutions and resources to ensure that women would not or could not say no. For me, his system was wicked. And he targeted young women from vulnerable families 
Most of the time, these young women were the ones supporting their entire family. He sometimes even directly supported the family, appearing as a generous benefactor. He made me believe that he was a father to me or a mentor. He made promises of education and scholarship, and we all longed for a better life. And it is at that time that when the confidence was built, that he made his sexual demands in return. If you said no, he made sure you suffered, humiliated you, made others to believe in you. And this is my story. Others tell that they had no choice but to accept his advances because and become his sexual slave. For some odd reasons, when Jama started to show interest in me, I thought that I would have a choice. The choice to say no, you know? That thing you say when you don't want something? But I was wrong. In 2014, I won a talent so hoping that I would get a scholarship to study abroad, as indicated to be the grand prize. But Jame started his courting ritual, like a spider spins its web. And over six months, he gave gifts and cash had running water installed at my mom's house, offered me a job which I declined. As a last resort, he asked me to marry him. When I refused to this again, he took offense. Who do you think you are? And that he is the president and that he gets any woman that he wants? Yeah, yeah, Jambe did not want... Um, sex with me or pleasure with me what he wanted to do was to hurt me what he wanted to do was to teach me a lesson what he wanted to do was to manifest his ego just like many of us can't believe that a girl can say no um someone like yajambe and in his position found it very disrespectful for um, a 19-year-old from not an elite background or not the daughter of a president to somehow gather some kind of audacity to say no to him, um, that he is a man probably who hasn't had so many no's. And my no wasn't because of um, 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 a sense of um, understanding or I was better off, I wanted to. My no was just because I felt it was wrong. This is my story. This is the story of many who remain silent. Because for some weird reason, people out there think that women make these stories up. And I wonder, why on earth would anyone voluntarily take on the shame, the blame, the public scrutiny just to accuse an innocent man? Especially in a society where being raped is a social suicide. They call us liars and they insult us. The politically correct ones hide behind the term alleged, arguing that there is no one to prove the crime, other than the woman of course, but then again, she cannot be trusted, right? However, when men claim that they were tortured, very few doubt their stories. Why is that? And he could freeze you, he could just do practically anything he wanted to do because of this magical and supernatural powers. And I think he was able to convince a lot of people, especially for those patients who had HIV AIDS, which led to disastrous consequences. And the fertility treatment? And the what? Fertility treatment? Yes, the fertility treatments. Um, it's surprising he had only two. Two children, yes. <laughs> That's the irony, isn't it? But he was said to have had many, many lovers and raped a lot of women. 
we, we have that emptiness. But that said, there are good things that he also achieved uh, for certain groups, like women, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about that? Yes. In the report, I basically suggest that... Uh, Paragraph 89. 89. Jame should be credited for having promoted many women to important positions of power. Uh, indeed. Uh, some would argue uh, that some of these appointments were basically posturing. Well, so are the appointments of many others, uh, politicians. I think I want to see, I want to see Jame as having at least made an effort uh, in some regard. I don't want to see him or paint him as, as totally irredeemable. Oh, I'm so sorry. Recognition of powerful men without recognizing the stories attached to them, especially in a truth commission setting, is an eraser. It is even more painful when it's coming from the very institutions created to help us heal. The truth is, when the banter fades and the cameras go off, you move on onto the next witness, the next story, onto the next headline. We don't ever. We watch, we listen, we learn to live all over again as we continue to hope and pray that it was all worth it. You know, ignoring social media blogs and experts is one thing. Letting institutions that are supposed to create rooms for justice and healing to erase us, that is not an option. From international courtrooms, Senate hearings in the United States, to the truth commissions in the Gambia, this common sense of doubt cannot continue to be the very best we can offer. So I hope one day we will come to acknowledge women's experiences instead of doubting them, exposing justices instead of protecting the perpetrator, and an awakened sense of accountability towards survival stories. I want to imagine a world in which women's stories matter and their strength help forge a new path for all of us.